Now, President Trump in an exclusive interview with Fox News doubling down on his assertion that he did nothing wrong during the 2016 campaign. And he defends payments made by his former attorney, Michael Cohen, to two women. This amid growing fallout after Cohen copped a plea. Uh, a deal with federal prosecutors on charges including tax evasion and alleged campaign finance violations. Mm -hmm. You're watching Outnumbered. I'm Harris Faulkner. Here today, Melissa Francis, host of Kennedy on Fox Business Network, and she points with love, Kennedy, <laughs> executive in residence <laughs> at American University and former Ohio Democrat State Senator Capri Cafaro. And in the center seat today, Lawrence Jones, almost called you Big Law. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Editor-in-chief of Campus Reform, and he is outnumbered Thank you for from Texas me, Big Law. That's yeah. right. Yeah, good to have you today. Thank you so much. So it's much news to, to break you. in. Absolutely. Thanks, oh, hello. <laughs> <laughs> Hi there, over there. Okay, right. girl. <laughs> All right, let's get to the news. President Trump again going after Michael Cohen during an interview with our own Ainsley Earhart. The president says Cohen's work for him has been overstated and that he was one of many lawyers who worked on and off with his team and saying that he only knew about hush money payments Cohen made to two women, quote, later on, end quote, while maintaining their lawful relationship and not from campaign funds. Watch. What he did, and they weren't taken out of campaign finance. That's a big thing. That's a much bigger thing. Did they come out of the campaign? They didn't come out of the campaign. They came from me. In fact, my first question when I heard about it was, did they come out of the campaign? Because that could be a little dicey. And they didn't come out of the campaign, and that's big. But they weren't, that's not a, it's not even a campaign violation. The president last night tweeted this, the only thing that I have done wrong is to win an election that was expected to be won by crooked Hillary Clinton and the Democrats. The problem is they forgot to campaign in numerous states, exclamation point. Uh, this was something that you were talking about in the green room just That's a short right. time ago. Well, I think this was all baked in when you decided to elect Donald Trump because this is what he did traditionally. He's had problems with women in the past. They, uh, you know, want to go to the press and put out a story and he takes his private money uh, and pays them off. This is what he did and I don't think he did not know about this. I don't think it was a campaign con contribution. I really don't think the American people care about this, though. They knew what they you were getting. You think it's baked in with the voters? It was already baked in when More the American people the got him. Oh, most definitely. They, uh, of course, there are going to be some people that disagree, but those are people that already didn't like the president to begin with and are already critical of him. I think the American people are more concerned when Congress takes a slush fund and pay, pays off women after they've done misdeeds than a man that was a billionaire that did this, that they knew this when they elected him. Well, with all due respect, Congress didn't do much with that shush fund, so they, I don't know no, how much they, they care about. Right. Capri? Yeah, I mean, I think one of, one of the things that you're bringing up here is this concept that there is a pattern of President Trump as private citizen Trump, um, you know, paying off women or doing whatever. And so that is a pattern and therefore would not be a violation of federal election law because basically you're saying that this is in the basic course of business. However, what President Trump just said there was, I asked whether or not it was campaign money, but I paid for it myself. So it makes me wonder, that kind of says that it was somehow related to the campaign and whether he... Just simply because he asked for clarification? For well, why would it ever come from the campaign money if it had nothing to do with the campaign? Maybe because he put his own money into the campaign. Well, and so let me, let me actually talk about that one really quickly. And, and anybody wants to go to fec.gov and, and look up federal election law. No, we have law. you. Go ahead. Um, <laughs> fantastic. I know nobody wants to, to do that. But, uh, you know, the, the issue here is he can spend all the money he wants. And that's not, that is not a federal into election. Into his right. campaign. Absolutely. It, but, and, and he can pay it directly to vendors, too. But the issue is he has to report it. And that is where the crime comes in. And that is a felony. So, Kennedy, how shocked should we be that a man who cheated on his wife just simply chose not to become too public? Public with that cash. You know, Donald J. Trump as citizen doesn't fall into any special category because of that. Most no. people would and, lie about and that. It's, it's not necessarily forgivable, but it's certainly, to Lawrence's point, it's not a surprise. Yeah. You know, and, and these were also uh, affairs and dalliances that he was trying to cover up from over a decade before. And I think one of the differences here, and, and there are 
uh, voters, particularly women in the suburbs, who are really turned off by these stories. But the thing that's interesting, if you compare it to Bill Clinton, which is the most recent direct comparison we have, Bill Clinton was scoring around when he was in the White House. Literally. And, and, yeah, and I, I think part of the issue voters have is, you know, hey, man, this is our time. It's like Mr. Hand. If you're here and I'm here, doesn't that make it our time? And if the president is covering up something he did as a private citizen, you know, again, they want to get rid of him because they don't like him. Right. And right. that's what Let elections are for. Here. Impeachment is sacred. So one of the people you okay. might have thought didn't want to get rid of you would have been your personal attorney and friend, Michael Cohen. <laughs> um, but then he flips. Here's what the president says about that. This whole thing about uh, flipping, they call it. I know all about flipping. For 30, 40 years, I've been watching flippers. Everything's wonderful, and then they get 10 years in jail, and they, they flip on whoever the next highest mm -hmm. one is, or as high as you can go. Mm -hmm. it, it almost ought to be outlawed. It's not fair. All right, let's let him have the last word on that and move on to this, too. If that's okay with you, Melissa. Yep. President Trump's response when he asked whether oh. he would pardon, was asked, rather, whether he would pardon Paul Manafort. Watch it, and then we'll move forward. I have great respect for what he's done in terms of what he's gone through. You know, he worked for Ronald Reagan for years. He worked for Bob Dole. He worked, I guess his firm worked for McCain. He worked for many, many people, many, many years. And I would say what he did, some of the charges mm -hmm. they threw against him, every consultant, every lobbyist in Washington probably does. Melissa, you were perched to take I, this. I am, because now everybody's talking about the pardon and how filthy and dirty and corrupt it would be if he went ahead and, and pardoned any of these people, and especially Manafort. And so it got me thinking about the 150 people that President Clinton pardoned, 140 of them on the very last day that he was in office, and all in told there's about 500 people who he either commuted their sentence. And that's fine. Presidents but they included, do that. absolutely. And they included, um, you know, lots of bank fraud and tax fraud, his own brother. Um, former oh, head Roger. secretary, Mark, the, Mark Rich. The son, well, I'm getting there. The son of the secretary of education for him, Susan McDougall, who was directly involved in Whitewater. And then, of course, there was Mark Rich that he's most famous for, whose crimes included tax evasion, um, but also doing oil deals with Iran during the Iran hostage crisis. Mm -hmm. He was selling oil and subverting those sanctions that were supposed to be helping to bring our people home. He pardoned this man after his wife made very large contributions to the Democratic Party, to Hillary Clinton Senate campaign, the Clinton Library, on and on. So I ask you, is it wrong? Probably. Is it a luxury of being the president? Absolutely. Yikes. I mean, I don't it know. Is. But can it's, I, can don't I be a hypocrite. Yeah. Don't be a hypocrite, everyone the, out no, there. No, here, I, this is actually kind of, I'm going to play super devil's advocate right now, and I'm sure no. Democrats are going to go crazy on me for this one, and, and I'll live with that. But here's the thing. Let's, let's look at it this way. You m mentioned a whole laundry list of people with similar kind of crimes that, that Bill Clinton pardoned the last day that he was in office. I think that people, even if they disagree with a pardoning of someone like Paul Manafort or Sheriff Joe Arpaio or whatever, are like, well, at least Donald Trump's being honest. He's not being a coward and doing it on his sure. way out. He's, the, he's doing it right in, out in the open. He could be up for re-election in 2020. He's willing to take those consequences. And people, whether they agree with it or not, I think at least find it refreshing because he's not doing the politician thing and sticking his head in the stand. Well, and I also think they would have some flexibility. Although, you know, I'm a libertarian. I believe that this is a power of the president, even though I don't like protecting people that are corrupt. But what the pr president would have some flexibility is that the American people that are out there watching this show today know that the reason that these people were targeted wasn't because of the crimes that they committed. It was because they were connected to the president and they used those crimes as a way to squeeze them. You don't think they would have gone after no. them otherwise? Absolutely I not. I mean, they did with Manafort. They, they, they did and they, they were not able to turn up exactly. the, the level of criminal activity that they did with you know, Do this, we know this what kind changed? of funding. Yeah, you have special counsel, which <laughs> has an unlimited Amount budget, of a, a very yeah. deep purse, but and they as did much time. Find a heck of a lot of wrongdoing. He, and he's, okay, but here's, here's, I guess, the ultimate point here. Yeah. I I hope this whole thing uh, allows candidates who run for president in the future to kind of clean up their campaigns. Can I you... hope people aren't attracted to the John and Tony Podesta's but we've known that for and decades, the Paul Kennedy, Manafort why don't they of the do world it anyway? because they want the power. The presidency has become so incredibly powerful and Congress has ceded so much of their responsibility to the presidency that now this... that there's someone so powerful that they don't like, that's when people this are freaking out.
yeah. the American people, point, point. as we have watched and when we interview them, picked an outsider because they know yeah. what you said is true. Let's let's move on and get to this, please. Kind of some juicy numbers, maybe. A majority of registered voters approve of the special counsel's Russia investigation, but a majority also think it's only somewhat or not at all likely that Bob Mueller will find President Trump has committed a crime or impeachable offense. I say some numbers interesting. You know, Democrats seem to want to do what you've been telling them not to do, Capri Cafaro, and that is preach impeach. We are going to go down a bad road if we preach the impeach, and here's why. And I, you, you're right, Harris. I've been saying this a lot. Number one, if we focus on that, we're basically telling the American people that we don't have a platform to offer them. We're basically Ideas. saying that we are the anti-Trump, and that's all we stand for. And that's not right. We need to, and we can, and we have offered more than just being the anti-Donald Trump. The other part of this in the midterm elections is that you know I think that the Republican base, and particularly the Donald Trump loyalists, are you know see the possibility of Democrats taking back that. House and the Senate as a potential opportunity for impeachment, right. and they don't want that. She's saying this as a Democrat from Ohio, there, a swing state. All the other Democrats that are going toward the socialist wing and is trying to out extreme the next, they're not going to take that same position, and that's why they're going to fail. Yeah, look at those California politicians. Exactly. You know, listen to, to people like Bernie Sanders. It's Nancy Pelosi who wants that power. She knows that if Republicans get jostled and excited and defensive about impeachment, uh, they're going to go to the polls. Those I, words seem I, like oxymorons, but okay. I <laughs> love that poll that you put up real quick, though. Yeah, because can it we said put back up which the first think, one on the special counsel? Well, the people think that the special counsel is doing a fair job, but you can also believe at the same time that they're not going to find a connection with the president colluding. And that's why they like it. Yeah. Because they know that once it's well, over, potentially it could we'll be know. over. But politically, politically, we don't know if it, if it ends, if it's really over. All right. More and more Democrats defending Supreme Court nominee Brett Kavanaugh's confirmation hearing should be halted in the wake of Michael Cohen's plea deal. Whether their concerns are valid or if it's just another delay tactic, we'll talk about it. Also, new fallout after an illegal immigrant is charged in the murder of Molly Tibbetts in Iowa. Democratic Senator Elizabeth Warren dodging a question about the case and trying to shift the focus to reuniting migrant families. Critics are calling her response tone deaf. We'll talk about that, too. Stay close. I'm so sorry for the family here, and I know this is hard. One of the things we have to remember is we need an immigration system that is effective that focuses on where real problems are. Fox News alert, at least three Democratic senators canceling meetings with Supreme Court nominee Brett Kavanaugh as some Democrats, including Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer, demand Kavanaugh's hearing be delayed in light of the Michael Cohen plea deal and Paul Manafort verdict. But some Democrats still going ahead with meetings with Kavanaugh today, including Dick Durbin, Sheldon Whitehouse, Chris Coons, and Cory Booker. Durbin, a short time ago after his meeting with Kavanaugh, Stepped, stepping up his demand for documents and reiterating that Democrats' concerns about where Kavanaugh st stands on presidential authority. Watch. Most of us believe as a, as a matter of principle in America that no one is above the law. No one, including politicians that serve in Congress and the President of the United States. And if you stick to that fundamental principle, then there has to be accountability. But Senate Judiciary Chairman Chuck Grassley vowing to move ahead with the hearing next month. And the White House also pushing back. Watch. This is a desperate and pathetic attempt by Democrats to obstruct a very highly qualified nominee. Uh, the hearing date has been set for September 4th, and Judge Kavanaugh will be there. Yeah. Lawrence, what do you think? Well, I, this is where I don't get Democrats. I understand that they don't like the Just here? Yeah, right. That's good. <laughs> um, Capri's hoping you'll make sorry. eye contact with her. <laughs> you got me. Um, this is isn't the issue to rally your base on because in return you're going to rally Donald Trump's base. There are a lot of Republicans that held their nose to vote for this president. Mm -hmm. Part of it was because of the Supreme Court. Scalia. And if they think that this is going to be a Supreme Court issue, I know they want to get it done before the midterms. Then they're going to turn out. I think there's no way Manchin is not going to vote for this nominee and Claire McCaskill. There's just no way they're not going to vote. Or Heidi Heitkamp. And, and, or Heidi Heitkamp. Can, can I step in just one Donald. second? Because we know that Senate Minority Whip Dick Durbin, a uh, Democrat from Illinois, is meeting today or has met already with um, 
with the, the nominee, Brett Kavanaugh. We're getting some real-time notes from that. And so Durbin apparently has just said that an effort to pressure red state Democrats to oppose Kavanaugh, quote-unquote, fails, says it really is up to him, talking about people like Donnelly and Manchin that you just said. I just wanted to interject that. I thought it was no, interesting. No, well, it, they, they know that they're going to lose the next election. And it's sad that we have to play politics this way. They probably wouldn't have ever voted for him. But they're going to face some pressure from their base. But they can't win. Yeah, Durbin says they can't. Yeah. That, that's what not leverage? what Democrats should With be doing. With what leverage, Dick Durbin, is my question. I mean, I used to whip votes for a living as the, as the minority leader. And, you know, if you and, and we and we had some very, very tough votes that we had to deal with. And, you know, I had members lose defending our, our Democratic governor at the time, Ted Strickland. So, you know, you need to be able to offer them something or threaten them with something he says, in just order let for it them be to up fall to in line. And if they yeah. think that they're on the ballot and they're going to lose, they have nothing to lose. He has nothing to give them. Represent your district. That's it's right. not so uh, much as just your, no, your political stance. No, but it's, it's guaranteed right. loss if you vote against confirming the Supreme Court justice right. because Chuck Schumer tells you to. Right. Yeah. You know, yeah. and it's like, and they, they also, I, I think these Democrats are, are really smart to meet with them. I don't understand uh, Hirono and Markey who refused to meet with Kavanaugh because they don't like the payoffs that the president made to a yeah. porn star and a Playboy model. That, does, that seems a little disconnected right. from the Supreme Court. And if your issue is, uh, as a, a jurist, he has sided on the side of those in power and even wrote an opinion in 2009 saying that the president shouldn't be charged and shouldn't be bothered with criminal legal matters about while in office. Right. And he, you know what? That should be a, a blessing for Democrats because right. at some point they're going to have a president <laughs> again. And I think they will love that. <laughs> and, and that person will also Judicial break the law, law, like all of these presidents exactly we have seen right. before. A little bit more from uh, Dick Durbin, the, the minority whip. And you were yeah. talking about whipping votes and how much experience you have in this. So you're wondering, what is he going to offer people? Durbin says if Democrats are unable to hold off a confirmation hearing, could delay Kavanaugh's debate and confirmation vote on the floor. But, quote, if we used every single minute of every single day, there would still be a vote. Delaying it doesn't stop it. Yeah, it, it doesn't, and so you have to, you know, sort of do the calculation. I loved when you talked about what you have to trade to put pressure on people or to give them a reward. But the math that they seem to not be doing is that the closer this goes to the election, the worse it is for Democrats because the more fired up Republicans are. I don't know how they don't see that math. Like, if Democrats I were a Democrat, I would want the vote today. And Just do it, get it over with, put it away, get, because, make it quiet. You know, and, and Kamala Harris gets to have her say, just like John Tester gets to have his. And if senators, if, if they want to maintain mm -hmm. the or ascend to the majority mm -hmm. in the Senate, if that's a Chuck Schumer once, then he should give these red state Democrats an opportunity to get a little leverage because this justice they need judge this. is going to be confirmed mm -hmm. either way. No matter what. And yeah, you can't and, forget and, about the Republicans as well. You still got Collins. She said she's not going to uh, make a decision until probably September the 4th. That's when she's going to announce what she's going to do. Then you got Murkowski as well. Well, Senator Durbin has wrapped up his meeting with Judge Kavanaugh. I was told that in my ear. And so now we have so much more of a transcript. And he said saying all of this, I'm wondering what kind of pressure there is now inside the Democrat Party to come up with an actual message that they can run on uh, in the midterms. And I know all politics is local, but Donald Trump is going to get into the, the race on the Republican side. And this president is about to take it full tilt national. And you've got to have something to go up against that. I'm I mean, wondering what that looks like. Is it panic? Well, he, he just said uh, in his last rally that the, the Secret Service is limiting his travel, that he would prefer to be on the road more. This is a president that has no problem getting on the road, unlike President Obama, who didn't work oh, with no, his he, own party. Well, he was unpopular oh, in 2010. He, 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 had he did to hide not in work 2010. within his party. He was well known in Washington that he didn't okay. meet with people. He didn't Enjoy the lunch. I, well. I, don't, I don't see the president letting Secret Service limit his travel, by the way. I wouldn't <laughs> bet on that one. President Trump once again hammering Attorney General Jeff Sessions and Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein in an exclusive interview with Fox today. He accuses Sessions of never taking control of the Justice Department amid bias against him and whether he will fire Sessions and whether he should next. He took the job and then he said, I'm going to recuse myself. I said, what kind of a man is this? The president, again, making it very clear about Attorney Jeff Sessions, Attorney General Jeff Sessions, and his deputy, Rod Rosenstein. In an exclusive interview earlier on Fox & Friends, the president showed his displeasure 
with Sessions, recusing himself from the Russia investigation and accusing him of failing to take control of a Justice Department he says is filled with bias. The president also letting loose on Rosenstein for his recommendation of FBI Director Christopher Wray and for signing off on the continued surveillance of former campaign official Carter Page. Whew, there was a lot there. And while the president insists he'd like to stay uninvolved with his Justice Department, he says he may have to step in and order the release of FISA documents that allowed for that surveillance of Page. Watch. At the right time, I think I'm going to have to do the documents. I didn't want to, uh, but I think I'm going to have to. There's such corruption before I got here. It's from before I got here. It's the Obama administration. As I've said, I wanted to stay uninvolved. But when everybody sees what's going on in the Justice Department, I always put justice now with quotes, it's a very, very sad day. Jeff Sessions recused himself, which he shouldn't have done, or he should have told me. Even my enemies say that Jeff Sessions should have told you that he was going to recuse himself, and then you wouldn't have put him in. Former CIA director and Trump antagonist John Brennan, well, he's got a new title now, saying, quote, I take no delight in seeing the steady collapse of a U.S. presidency, but I do take strong comfort in knowing that the rule of law and our great government institutions are prevailing. Things ultimately will get better and we will heal as a nation, end quote. Kennedy, what say you? I am laughing at that because yeah. President Pence thinks that John Brennan is a big fathead. I'm Wait. pretty sure. <laughs> <laughs> I, heard I heard this first hand. Yeah. And also, yeah. I can guarantee, as a Hoosier, that uh, President Pence is not going to reinstate his security clearance because John Brennan has done some unlawful and untoward things and doesn't deserve to have it back. Yeah. Wow. So there. You are yeah. way looking ahead. I've and and, and, and I'm, I'm not even waiting into the session's murky pool. Yeah. You know, I will let Lawrence do that. Uh, you know, yeah, know. go right ahead. <laughs> Well, I, I never thought, and, you know, just to talk about, he should have told the president that the president is absolutely right. Even people on the left have said that he should have told the president that he was going to recuse himself. Do you think he knew at that point? Yeah, he knew. He yeah, knew. he definitely he knew. knew. He knew. Um, but he got into the swamp. He started playing around with the Department of Justice, the FBI. They all become buddies and they go to lunch together. And so a man that was supposed to have fought, been a conservative hero against that type of stuff, and is now a part of it. But I want to point to something. I never thought that Donald Trump was going to be the president that could possibly get criminal justice reform done. Because we're learning so many different issues. We're learning about the FISA court, which Republicans supported at one time. We're learning about the plea system. We're learning about corruption in the DOJ and the mm -hmm. FBI. What I cannot understand is the party that has always railed against that now all of a sudden loves the FBI, loves the DOJ. Can, can I just and I don't understand why Democrats are doing that right now. Well, can, let me just back up for, for just one second and go back to the whole issue of Jeff Sessions being part of the swamp. I mean, the guy was a United States senator, you know, for a very long time. But uh, the least... Oh, that's interesting. You know, but the least swampy yeah. thing that you can do is recuse yourself. I mean, so if the swampier thing would have been to not recuse yourself because you were part of the campaign and get right in there. So, I mean, uh, you know, to me, I don't see that as a swamp thing. And this is the one area that I do have concerns with the rhetoric surrounding the, ju the, the justice system. Yes, are there bad apples? Sure, but there are bad apples in any institution. We cannot systematically erode and create panic amongst the American people that the, that the criminal justice system does not work and is somehow real. Right. 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 DOJ, we have a pretty bad panic orchard. worthy. Yeah, I don't know. Okay, I, I, love, I think I like that. the Department of Justice looks pretty panic worthy. I mean, the rest of it, I understand, like, the system as a whole should work. And I don't know. I, I, I'm with you. I think Jeff Sessions probably did the right thing by recusing himself. I'm kind of tired of thinking about it and talking about it, and oh. I don't know why they're always railing on it. But regardless, I do think that he has exposed, as Lawrence said, that the Justice Department is really political and they're weaponizing a lot of the things that they have at their disposal for political purposes. I, I would have been surprised, I was surprised by everything we have found out about them. I wouldn't have bet that it was the way it was. And I do think we want to see those FISA we documents. So, so uh, Senator Lindsey Graham was talking about this whole thing with, with Attorney General Sessions and whether he'll go. He says it's very likely that the president will replace Sessions. The president's entitled to attorney general he has faith in, somebody that's qualified for, for the job. And I think there will come a time, sooner rather than later, 
where it will be time to have a uh, new face and a fresh voice at the Department of Justice. Replacing him before the election to me would be a non-starter, but the idea of having a new attorney general uh, in the first term of uh, President Trump's administration I think is very likely. How much does that really change everything? And then the president also uh, weighing in on the fact that Christopher Wray wasn't a good good idea either. At least that's how I understood it. Yeah, but the problem is because of the political tension right now, he can't replace any of them. I mean, even... Why not? He can do what he wants. They, they well, have to be confirmed, they, they be by, confirmed the by the Senate. And there are a lot of Republicans that, as Lindsey Graham said, who is now a supporter of the president, saying that it's a non-starter for him. So what is he supposed to do? Yeah, but we've heard this. We've heard this from people like Senator Rand Paul. Oh, never going to do tax cuts. Never going to. Everything's a non-starter, non-starter. Oh, wait, what time is it? Yeah, I'll go for that. I mean, the president pushes against this swamp that we keep talking about. And sometimes the swamp goes, wow, it is really bad in here. Maybe I should step out and... Yeah, and I, pass something with this president. I you think, don't think so? You're I think, shaking your I head. I think this whole Mueller thing has muddied the water a little bit, and the public in the public Which eye, Mueller they got to worry about their the own. The last couple of days, or just all of it This is the swampiest few days we've seen in a long time. All of it in general has muddied the water, and these guys have to worry about their own reelections, and they don't want to look to their constituents like they're covering. I uh, think when when the Mueller investigation is complete, depending on the outcome, then all. then he can get rid of yeah. Sessions. I don't think he has to do it right now. I, I think it raises too many questions, but I think getting rid of Jeff Sessions would be uh, good for the president. It would be great for the country. Yes, and Jeff Sessions too. He probably wants to go at this yeah, point. He's, yeah, yeah, he's, he's a punching bag. Love Joe yeah. sends him handwritten thank you notes, Poor and thing, chocolates yeah. every week. All right, uh, let's, let's turn to Iowa now. In new details on the murder of college student Molly Tibbetts and whether a glaring hole in immigration checks was missed. What more we know about the suspect in her murder? Stay with us. New questions over the suspect in the murder of Molly Tibbetts and whether he was in the U.S. illegally. This as the dairy farm where he worked says they did not use the federal E-Verify system to vet his identity and legal status. Matt Finn joins us right now from Brooklyn, Iowa. Matt. Melissa, so far, federal immigration officials tell Fox News that Rivera never applied for a DACA grant, was never given one, and that so far there's no record to indicate he had any type of immigration status in this country. However, Rivera's attorney said in court that somehow Rivera is in this country legally. We are working right now to locate any documentation that might prove that. And today we have new video to show you of the exact location where police say Rivera placed Molly Tibbetts' body. It's in a very remote location about 13 miles away from where Molly lived and was abducted. From our perspective, it seems Rivera walked about 60 feet between two cornfields, and then police say Rivera admitted to carrying Molly Tibbetts' body not too deep into one of the cornfields. Lead investigators say that Rivera could face even more charges if they determine molestation. And a lead investigator sat down with Fox News and expanded on how the alleged killer led them to Molly's body. This particular night on the 18th of July, he once again saw her and, um, as it says in the complaint and affidavit, approached her and ended up interfacing with her and ultimately ended up uh, tackling her, I think it was, or chased her down, one of the two. We were just lucky and fortunate that he was willing to ultimately end up showing us where, where Molly was. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're thankful for that. And Rivera's employers at a farm not far from here retracting their initial statement saying we did not use the federal e-verify system and now they say they want a better system and laws in Iowa and across the country to prevent this from happening again. Melissa. Matt, thank you. In the meantime, the president seizing on Molly Tibbetts' murder to highlight his call for immigration reform and stronger borders. He also takes a shot at Democrats who are not supporting his proposals. Watch. Molly Tibbetts, an incredible young woman, is now permanently separated from her family. A person came in from Mexico illegally and killed her. We need the wall. We need our immigration laws changed. We need Republicans to do it because the Democrats aren't going to do it. This is a host of Democratic senators blasting Homeland Secretary Kirsten Nielsen 
Writing in a letter, quote, this administration's anti-immigrant policies have provoked the worst immigration crisis in modern times, and under your leadership, it grows worse by the day. Meantime, Senator Elizabeth Warren expressing her condolences for the Tibbetts family, but also suggesting the real issue is family separation at the border. I'm so sorry for the family here, and I know this is hard. One of the things we have to remember is we need an immigration system that is effective, that focuses on where real problems are. I think we need immigration laws that focus on people who pose a real threat. And I don't think mamas and babies are the place that we should be spending our resources. Warren's remarks stirring an intense reaction on social media, many calling her tone deaf. Um, she talks about family separation. Gets which families permanently separated, Kennedy? I know, and, the and, and that's what's so heartbreaking is I'm really going to take the lead of the Tibbetts family when they talk about keeping this young woman in their hearts and, you know, really expressing their gratitude for the outpouring of love and support. And, you know, as we see in the aftermath of these mass shootings, we kind of need to take a second before we politicize everything and really take stock in the tragedy. And this young woman's life and that instant that allowed a complete psychopath to end her life mm -hmm. before we start talking about immigration policy and border separations and things that take us completely away from this young woman's life and her tragic death. So yeah. and, and I think yeah. that both sides are to blame here because they're, they're both trying to make it a political issue instantly and that's always the biggest Kennedy, problem I have you, after mass You shootings. took the words out of my mouth in many ways because as I was looking at this issue, you know, I thought to myself, um, you know, we are um, totally uh, ignoring the human aspect of, you know, this tragedy. No different than oftentimes we totally ignore the human aspect of Parkland or any mass shooting. So each side is, is sort of guilty of this. You have Republicans saying, look at this tragedy. This is a battle cry to do immigration reform. Then you have Democrats saying, look at this tragedy. This is the reason why we need to do, you know, gun control. And so no one is, and because legislators are often and lawmakers are often reactionary rather than pro proactive in their policy making this is what happens but, and but then that's, people just that's politicians their... and i think on the side of regular people i mean as parents i think we were all watching this and long before we knew what happened to her we're already devastated and terrified mm -hmm. because you know i heard somebody last night on the five saying you know this is one woman's murder or you know that, that lots of people are murdered and no this struck a chord long before we knew who did it because she was out jogging and she was in a safe town and she was someone's child who sat there and tried to hold it together and did the best that he could to try and do something to find his daughter and for every parent it just it makes you cry well, and just as human beings, I mean, uh, not even as a parent. She's 20 years old. She's at the beginning yeah. of her, her life. I mean, she's, she's another human being, an adult just like the rest of us, uh, has a right to go out and jog. You know, just a few of the facts that I, I think sometimes get lost in all of this. This man, this suspect, had been living in this country illegally for mm -hmm. up to seven years. He had a job. Uh, at a, at a, a stable place, Yerby Farms, there in Iowa. This was a town of fewer than 1,500 people in the last census. These people all know each other. He's living among them. This could have been anybody in that town or anywhere around it. This is completely frightening. We haven't talked about what it's like to be in Brooklyn, Iowa, on this fine Thursday after the loss of Molly Tibbetts and what has changed. Clearly, something was broken. He gave a fake name, some fake I identification, materials in Yerby Farms. I, I think it was uh, Miss Lane who owns it. Dana Lane owns it. Uh, and, and said, look, we worked with what we were given. E-Verify was not used. Maybe E-Verify needs to be something that's mandatory in the state of Iowa. You've heard Republicans talking about it forever. Is this a point where they can get together? And I ask you, because I know you were strong on the subject, Lawrence, yeah. what in the world does this have to do with separation policies at the border, however egregious they may be, what in the world did those have to do with the death of Molly Tibbetts? Absolutely nothing. And you can agree about comprehensive immigration reform and all that, but none of that matters right now. In the midst of people mourning, first of all, it's not 
good politics to do this when you know people that support the president because this has been his argument all along about you know mm. what we have to get better at this system because America is gonna die you saw how people rallied around Kate Steinle I just didn't think it was a good move and it seemed like she was just insincere in the middle of that and I understand that she's a politician but you don't so say what, that you don't put the focus on the children at the border it, when an American citizen just died and it makes the point that Republicans have been making for a while that they care more about illegals than the American citizens it, in this country. I think this is an opportunity for Democrats to actually step up and be the adults in the room by focusing on things like the employers that are that are violating. If we stop the and demand. how we help employers. Exa that. Exactly. I mean we need if we stop the demand for for people coming here right e is a big solution. we need big to solution. focus on they that may, they home may take away your democrat card <laughs> you i'm getting yelled at at twitter hardcore today okay. by, by democrats it's all so. you can't look at twitter homeland security secretary nielsen laying out what the administration is doing to protect our elections from foreign interference this november and beyond but it was not enough for some democrats who say we are only playing defense whether they have a point we'll debate it next to those foreign adversaries who seek to meddle in or impact our election, our message from the U.S. federal government to you is simple. We will identify you and you will pay a high price. Breaking news now in the Michael Cohen case. Uh, we have just learned that the chairman of the Inquirer Publishing, the executive, has been granted immunity in the Cohen case. That is a case brought on, as you saw just recently, uh, by federal prosecutors that was handed by Bob Mueller's team to them. Uh, David Pecker is his name, publishing exec, met with prosecutors, we're told, to describe involvement of Michael Cohen, the, uh, President Trump, in a pre-presidency, obviously, candidate Trump, in hush money deals to women ahead of the 2016 election. Uh, the Wall Street Journal is reporting this, and the Wall Street Journal reports federal prosecutors have granted immunity to David Pecker, the CEO of the company that publishes the National Enquirer in Cohen investigation. And the Wall Street Journal reports Pecker met with them uh, in the manner that I just described involving Michael Cohen and then candidate Donald Trump. Prosecutors are indicating that Dylan Howard, the chief content officer at the National Enquirer, a parent company, also will not be charged in criminal investigation of Michael Cohen. But the deal that everyone is talking about that's breaking news, according to the journal, is David Pecker granted immunity. Your thoughts? Well, I think that Bob Mueller is not looking for a legal case. He's looking for to build the case for Congress for some sort of impeachment. He realizes that he can't do it on the legal side. And I think uh, this is a bad move. The more and more they do this type of stuff, the American people are going to push back. It seems like they're trying to get rid of a duly elected president, whether you like him or not. I have my disagreement. Uh, Kennedy, that I, I want to go to you because you have met David Pecker. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as it pertains to this line of questioning and investigation, he fits in how? Uh, he fits in because of his personal relationship with Donald Trump. And, you know, he's an incredibly powerful person who has overseen uh, a lot of content and has been able to control that. And obviously, the National Enquirer, uh, this is not the first foray they've had into presidential politics. You remember they, uh, they broke the John Edwards story. When he, when a it, lot of them, somebody I mean, else they, that was they've, they've indicted been on, top on of a lot of stories, yeah. elections issues. But, but I'll say one thing because I've heard Judge Andrew Napolitano say before that this idea that that they bought the story and then killed it, catch and release, yeah, catch and kill, catch and kill, catch and release, whatever it is, is a is um, somehow fraud. And I would push back against that because if you want to get your story out, you go to the New York Times, you go to um, you know a national television show. If you want money for your story, mm -hmm. you go to the National Enquirer. It's not that you're trying to get have your voice heard and talk about something that you think the public needs to know. Mm -hmm. Because let's be honest, when you're standing at the counter looking at magazines in the drugstore, usually the top of the National Enquirer says something that's not yeah, terribly and, and you're, believable. You're selling and your rights you're just to the story. You're just collecting money based on a past experience. It's it, a transaction. Not that that wasn't part of what you're talking about, but particularly with 
with the Playboy model, uh, Karen McDougal, as I understood it in the case, and that's the only reason why I'd say those words <laughs> during this hour. But, but in this particular case, she actually wanted something more than just money. And it was her attorney who she believed was working with, you know, the National Enquirer execs or someone on their behalf um, to help her not tell her story outside the National Enquirer so mm. they could catch and kill I mean, but that's, that's right? the exclusive. That's, wanted, that's essentially like, what they're paying presence. you for. She wanted and, to be a model. And, and Look, British tabloids do this all the time. They, they pay a Look, bunch right. of money, and that's how you people, learn about People are in it for cash. But can I go back to what you said, Lawrence? To do, though, one second. What does this have to do, though, if, if you talk about a case that Bob Mueller has handled, handed to prosecutors? Is this part of that squeeze, Kennedy? Yes. You know David Pecker. Again, I come to you. Yeah, absolutely, because, you know, this is a person that's probably got very valuable information, whether it's texts or emails uh, with President Trump and with Michael Cohen and, and certainly at, with executives at his media company. But the thing is, what it goes back to is, will voters be surprised? Damn. No. And w will it change how they feel? But and that I doesn't think, matter. I think the answer to both the, of those can I, can is Can I please no. jump in? Because there are two separate issues here. I agree that the electorate, by and large, this is baked in for them. They see this is, you know, Trump from The Apprentice, whatever. But this is about, again, the justice system. This is not a giant witch hunt. You had to have done something for them to come after you. The, you know, the guy from The Inquirer has to have something that is cooperating for them well, they're to just, talk I to I agree them. with you. They're, they're following the trail of the money. I mean, it's very clear. You just follow the money to see but you don't if get the law you was broken people with crimes they didn't commit. somewhere along the way. And having him cooperate is part of following the right. money. And that's where Michael Cohen's, you know, sort of assertions in in court yeah. yesterday or two days ago under oath is, well, when, is relevant because that is what got you to the Inquirer guy. The Inquirer guy. When you look you at the paperwork, else. though, and, and we haven't seen everything that Michael Cohen agreed to, but we're seeing more, you understand that there are other entities who possibly could be charged. So just because you haven't seen charges doesn't mean they're not Almost being talked Almost definitely. There's a lot of people baked in. We'll be right back.